You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 93, the end of Full Arch Impressions as we know it. This week on The Dental Guys, Mark Ludlow from the University of South Carolina joins John and Wes to discuss the end of Full Arch Impressions and how is implant education improving in dental school? Are more students placing dental implants? Are they learning the parts and pieces of dental implant dentistry? We find out this and so much more this week on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. Do you want to be able to understand, place, restore, and implement dental implants into your practice? Well, we've got the course for you, Restorative Driven Implants, taught by the Dental Guys. Restorative Driven Implants is coming to Des Moines, Iowa this fall 2019. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com right now to sign up for the next series. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes the Dental Guy. And I'm John the Dental Guy. John, it's been, um, man, I've been excited about this episode just almost more than any episode we've done recently. We've been talking a lot about eliminating an impression in our dental mm. office. And we we keep talking about there's no validated way to eliminate impressions in our full arch implant restorations and really really full arch dentistry period because cross arch and all these things that we have been done on models and it's been shown there's just not really any good research and now we have all these new scanners and right. you happen to know you went to dental school with Mark Ludlow and at the time I, I won't go into the story but you had no idea that your friend was going to be doing the research to validate workflows for manufacturers concerning full arch implant restorations. Right, right. I mean, Mark Mark was a, always a, a great guy, but and I knew that he would do some amazing things. But um, and I think when he when he went back to Pross, and we'll talk about this in, the, in a little while, but he. He w- ended up, you know, at one of the, the best probably residencies in the country to have started down this pathway toward thinking about what's possible in the digital world. And, you know, it's interesting because we talk so much about this in the last few episodes as we talked about scanners and what's possible with Prime Scan, blah, blah, blah. You know, we kept coming back to this whole idea and it caught a lot of f- fire on social media about how there's no validated peer-reviewed research on say something like prime scan and but it's interesting because at the same time that there's not a lot of validated research on that you got all these people posting all this stuff about full arch implant dentistry and we talked about this before and it continues west it continues it continues and really what we find out in this episode is what's being done to make that dentistry better because yeah you can do full arch dentistry with um, the some of these scanners today and some of the printers on the market, but there was always this slop as right. we hear, right? And right, what was the right. slop factor? Well, you know, I, I you know, let me tell you something about slop. It's it's whenever you're tiling. I have experience doing a lot of tile work. Growing up, I did. A, we tiled this our sunroom, and then it seems like that always my parents were always doing a project, and we were doing this tile, and I'll never forget. <laughs> My dad say, you know, when we get over in the corner, when in doubt, grout, right? So (laughs) what was grout for tile? It was the slop factor. It's the factor like when you're off by a 16th or an eighth or a quarter of an inch. Put a little bit more grout in there. Put a little more grout in there and no one will be able to tell. And so what we're seeing with these full arch fully digital implant true true fully digital Let's say that is again digital <laughs> fully digital yeah <laughs> we're seeing we're seeing that the the end result if you see what's really truly going on 
is that they are milling out a bridge and they are using custom abutments <clears throat> and they are cementing either onto custom abutments or some type of titanium cylinder. Or if it's if it's designed to be fixed, screw retained, they're they're creating a big cement gap inside the prosthetic and they're cementing it on. Now, yes, is that technically fully digital? Yes. But come on, man, that's not that's not as good. It's not as good as what we can do with a verification jig and a master model until now, possibly, Wes. Until yeah. now, because in this interview you're about to hear, <clears throat> Mark is going to talk about not only the current state of implant education at MUSC as well as kind of among other schools, but he's going to talk about really what is possible now with the newest generation of scanners. Are we finally at a time, Wes, that we can truly put an end to taking full arch impressions with impression material and go to scanning. And, and, and we have to have not only a good scanner, but we have to have a validated workflow mm. that works and for not software. just 0.1% mm. of the population of dentists, but 100% of the population of dentists who choose to do this. And mm. so Mark's going to share that with us coming up in this next interview. So we know you want to hear all about it. So stay tuned after this brief note from our sponsor, and we'll bring you Mark Ludlow's interview. It's gonna blow your mind. This is Justin Goodbrand. Here is today's tip. Should you hire an investment advisor? You know, dentists are naturally inquisitive and you're also well-educated. You're smart and analytical. However, Google will only get you so far. I strongly advise you to hire the people who are experts in their industries. With an investment advisor, make sure you're hiring a fiduciary. And make sure this fiduciary is a person who understands dentists and provides comprehensive planning services. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. Well, we are here with the primetime interview here on The Dental Guys and uh, we're here with Mark Ludlow, and um, I, I get the privilege of sort of introducing Mark because Mark and I go way back. Way back. And uh, we go way back, man. And, you know, it's it's very cool. The other day, I saw Stephen Chu on uh, over in Charlotte. He was doing a, a talk about, uh, about some implant stuff, and he made an interesting comment about his residency and his dental school. He's like, you know, these people that you go to school with, he's like, they're the people that you can... He's like, you will be amazed at how you kind of re-encounter these people who are pushing when you're in school. The same people that were kind of pushing to be good, uh, you sort of re-encounter them and they're, they're doing interesting things and you can ask them interesting questions because you have a different relationship. So Mark and I went to dental school uh, together back at UConn, back at Connecticut, the Death Star. The Death Star. And <laughs> which anybody that's gone to UConn knows as you come up over uh, the Interstate 84 and the Death Star rises over the horizon, you know you have arrived. Everybody that's listening to this from UConn knows yeah. what we're talking about. And um, I got to know Mark because we ended up in the same, the, just long story, long story short, at UConn, they still do medical models. So you are in with the med students and Mark and I ended up, we're doing, we did, you do, so you do full body dissection. And so you spend a tremendous amount of time dissecting a guy. The foot. In our, in our case. And uh, yeah, the foot, the knee, all the important yeah. things for dentistry. And Mark and I ended up in the same group, the same body dissection group. And we got to know each other. I mean, you get to know somebody pretty well when you're like cutting on a body for whatever it was, eight months or nine months. And we ended up really connecting. Uh, there was a kind of a cool little group of, of guys that we got to be close with, ended up studying a lot together. Uh, Mark was always pushing the envelope, talking a lot about what was new, what was coming. And then, you know, so after school, we both went into general practice and um, we both went right out of school without residency. We both felt like we were ready to go into practice, kind of similar in that way. Um, and so Mark was out in Utah. And then um, after a few years of general practice, and, and I wasn't talking to Mark as much during this time, we were kind of doing our own thing. And, and Mark, at that point, you, you, you decided that it was time 
to go back. You, I've, I, from what you've told me a little bit about this is that you, you, know, you, you were loving doing some of the complex stuff, right. but you wanted to do more of it and you wanted to have that high level training. And you ended up at one of the, probably one of the best residency programs, especially at that time with Lyndon Cooper at the helm at UNC. Right. So, so then we reconnected back, uh, funny, at the AO. A lot of our show ends up coming back to the AO many times. And Mark was on the podium at the corporate forums for Dent Supply talking about digital uh, and talking about what was kind of new. So, Mark, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, we're glad to have you here. Um, t- does that does that kind of cover it? Is that is that sort of describe sort of a little bit of the briefness of your journey? Yeah. I know there's a lot more in that. Yeah, I mean, you hit it pretty pretty well. I mean, it was uh, it was a convoluted journey. I mean, it, it wasn't one of those things where you say, "Oh, I'm going to get out and do this and this and this and this," and everything lines up that way. But the reality is, you know, I. I was with you, we were working together. I mean, I think as far as from a general dentistry perspective as students, we were really kind of pushing things as about as far as we could take it. And then yeah. from there, you know, I went out, um, partnered up initially from there. The partnership didn't really work out too well. Um, went out and did a cold start practice. And and from that kind of built up the practice exactly how I wanted it to. And it was really trending towards kind of a prosthodontic practice. And you know, the days where I was most excited were the days where I was doing, you know, larger cases, big implant cases. I took, you know, some implant residencies and a bunch of different things like that to get really familiar with implants. And the other kind of key I wanted to do was really dial in digital dentistry. So, I mean, you know, back then, you know, all there was, was, was CEREC and, uh, you know, we got it literally, you know, two months into practice. And, you know, those were my two focuses were digital dentistry and, uh, and implants and, uh, you know, had a really good time, really loved practice, really loved, you know, having my own business and treating my patients. But uh, I just kind of kept getting this call. Like I, I really enjoyed the days where I was working on much larger, kind of bigger full mouth type stuff. And the days where I was doing, you know, the the 50 fillings that day, those were just the days that uh, weren't the most fun times in the world. So ultimately I yeah. decided at that point, you know, what's another three years on another 30, 35 year career. So I ended up selling my yeah. practice, going back. Um, you know, it was funny when I, when I met Lyndon um, and got with the program, I knew right out of the gate that that was where I should be. We shared similar philosophies, <clears throat> um, similar, similar outlooks on, you know, life and practice and, and treatment philosophies. And from there, you know, just took right off and, spent some good time with him and still, you know, get the privilege of working with him and, you know, talking to Lynn and, you know, about every day or every other day. And, you know, now I've been down here at MUSC four years um, and I'm the implant director here and have a, have a lovely time because I get to do all sorts of implant dentistry and there's such a extremely great base of digital kind of knowledge and technology that is in our school that, I mean, it's kind of unparalleled when you look at it to other mm. universities that are out there, just thanks to some great predecessors that have been here before me. So so you went right from residency into, in a way, kind of uh, from what you'd said, you know, that they had a, a foundation yep. uh, that was good, but you really were able to take a lot of what you learned from Linden and from a lot of other folks there at in your residency and take that to MUSC. Now, did, did they have a prosthodontic residency there at South Carolina? No, so at South Carolina, we we didn't, nor do we currently. Um, the reason why I went here is, you know, some people that went before me, namely Wally Renee, um, had really set a extremely strong, kind of a very high level of digital dentistry at our school. I mean, the kids were, you know, I mean, we start them off scanning their first year of dental school. I mean, it's in their anatomy courses. It's right as they start off wow. their training. And so, I mean, <clears throat> these kids, you know, by the end of the first year, they've scanned about 100 arches already, hmm. you know, just off of type of and whatnot, just because all of our pre courses and everything is based on digital. And so if I was going to teach, and it was a really hard decision to decide whether, okay, do I want to go right back out and practice or teach again? And, and ultimately, I decided... Yeah. You know, I wanted to to try to, you know, help kind of elevate our pros field. And that was the whole purpose behind going into teaching. And I was only looking for places that shared similar philosophies as mine. And MUSC was absolutely the perfect fit for it. So you say implant director there. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what does that look like day to day? What all are you involved with on a day to day basis? 
I'm involved with a lot of stuff. Fortunately, it's great. Um, so I, I'm over the division of implant prosthodontics. And what we do there is basically all the implant treatment that comes into to MUSC kind of funnels through me and funnels through my clinic. Um, so I run the implant clinic. It's where all the students work up all of their cases, where all the restorative work is done. Um, I get the privilege of I also get to help precept in oral surgery and perio, and I get to do a lot of surgery with with my oral surgery and perio residents. So all the kind of larger implant cases I get to work with them on. Um, any immediate load, any immediate temporization, stuff like that. I'm usually the preceptor for those type cases. Um, and then I also work with our AGD residents and we do our little more complicated cases up there, although we've been doing a lot of those as well down in, in student clinics, namely hybrids and different things like that for patients that have that type of need. So, I mean, there's a a wide berth of implant treatment that these kids get. And I mean, it's it's a pretty progressive program that we've got going going down there. So the fact you don't have a prosthodontic residency means that you're you're saying that the, the dental students, say third and fourth year, maybe fourth year, are involved in hybrid restoration type of Type of prosthetics. They are, yeah. We try to keep it for fourth year because third year, I mean, yeah. You know, <laughs> right. it's like you're just doing an occlusal. Here, here, yeah, if you here, can. here's a tooth. You have three hours to do an occlusal. Let's do a hybrid in the next day. So yeah, we right. we generally try to keep it with with fourth years. We've kind of pulled back a little bit this year on it just because it's a pretty strong endeavor. But the the rationale was, you know. I was doing them all up in AGD with our residents up there. And the reality is there were just so many patients that needed this type of restoration that we decided to, you know, open it up to student cases as well. Um, but, you know, it's kind of, it's funny. It's kind of almost that pinnacle level of, of implant dentistry because it takes, you know, all the fundamental knowledge of, of implants, fundamental knowledge of removable, fundamental knowledge of fixed, you know, plus mm -hmm. knowing how to manage an occlusion and wax ups and everything it kind of takes all the skills and puts it into one thing which is to be i mean truly frank's a little bit tough sometimes for a fourth year dental student to really grasp yeah. all the concepts yeah. which are going on in there but still it does afford them a great opportunity to be able to do something that they probably wouldn't do anywhere else so so yeah mark wow. i uh, welcome to the show, and thanks for coming on tonight. I really appreciate you taking time out of your evening. My late, pleasure. Late evening, right? <laughs> yeah, the kids just went to uh, bed, so we're good. Right. Our kids yeah, are in bed, too. Yeah. So, you know, the the thing that, that always I, I'm able to help out in a residency here in uh, where I live and um, just kind of uh, spread some of the knowledge to the residents that come through this GPR here the thing that always kind of rings true with each class year as coming into these residencies out of dental school is how little implant knowledge there is and how little touches right. that a student gets. Now, it's interesting because John and I and yourself, um, from what I understand, um, we kind of you know, dove in and pushed yeah. so that we would get some implant knowledge in school. John and I got the same award as seniors and we didn't yeah, the know AO each the AO award at the time. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. So, rocked it. Yeah. But but the amount of touches in dental school, even today, um, for an undergraduate, much less a a graduate program or not, I shouldn't say undergraduate, but a, you know, a DDS program versus a postdoctoral program like a GPR AGD is pretty limited across the country. Tell us a little bit of what you're doing there and how you're kind of trying to break the mold. Yeah. And, and, and what's the, what's the norm? I think like set up for us, what, cause you see, obviously in this, in this arena, you, I know, see what's going on at other right. schools. And you had to look a lot at that when you were sort of figuring out what you were going to teach. So yeah, set, set up for us, like, what's the norm now as you see it? Because we're kind of jaded. We don't see all of it. And then what do you guys do? Because I feel like what you just said is very different than what we're hearing from a lot of these other dental schools and, like Wes said, even residencies, like AGDs, GPRs. Right. Well, as far as what the norm is, that's kind of a really tough question to answer just because, 
as you guys are stating, I mean, there is a whole wide variety and a wide berth as to what people are doing. I mean, there's some that, you know, it's completely off of bottles. You're lucky if you get maybe, you know, there was a place that I spoke at a couple of years ago and I mean, they had really no one to do any implants. There was just one specialist that was there. And I mean, they were lucky mm. if they could you know, impress one. According to the CODA standards, you need to at least have a, an experiential. And again, that can be off of a Typhodon or something like that. Uh, it's supposed to be with, with a patient. But again, you know, due to just some of the issues that go on with schools, I mean, some kids may not have that opportunity. So there's a wide variety of, of experience out there and what is taught. Um, I can speak personally from our program, you know, and, and where we were at you know, at UNC and up where, when we were together at UConn. But, you know, I thought we had a pretty good fundamental thing at UConn because we were able to actually, for sure, you know, team up with a resident and do implants. And I mean, this was, you know, quite a long time ago. And, yeah, exactly. And, you know, back then you got to give a lot of credit to the people that had put that together because for they sure. had really kind of figured out where things needed to go. And I think that's the way most of us are trying to move things together now. As far as our students, we have a pretty robust education for our students. Uh, they take three implant courses. I do the second and the third course. The second course is kind of their fundamentals that I've really tried to structure this course into very practical patient-based stuff so that it's not, you know, just let's learn about osteointegration. It's here are a variety of patients coming in and these are the different things that you need to look at for your patient. These are what type of implants to look for, you know, whether using short implants, long implants, et cetera, et cetera. And so we move from that perspective all the way up through hybrids by the end of their third year with a lot of different guest speakers, even going into zygomatics and different things of that nature hmm. so that they have a very robust education. And the way that we've kind of structured it is kind of all of our patients get the exact same experience. So a patient comes in, we, we're either taking an intraoral scan on these patients diagnostically in the implant clinic, or even if they take a conventional impression, that will be digitized. So every patient that comes into the implant clinic gets digitized. And from there, 100% of our cases are digitally waxed up. So the, the students work with three of my work study students that they sit down, they go ahead on, on either three shape dental designer or, or a Serona in lab, and we'll go ahead and digitally design the the prosthetics of the case. That way we can get some better diagnostics because that was one of the things when I first got there, you know, everyone was still hand waxing. And I mean, come on, we all remember those days of hand waxing. I mean, it look, we weren't all that talented, if you will. Okay. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I sat there looking at these diagnostic wax ups and I said, you know, we've got to elevate our diagnostic game if we want to get better placement and better outcomes. So that's why we moved to 100% mm -hmm. digitally waxing everything up. And from there, you know, the students will then merge it with a CBCT. So every patient gets a CBCT. So the patient walks in, gets a CBCT, the digital wax up, and the diagnostic scan so that we've got all the information we need to to be able to plan these cases. And then from there, they'll sit down with the residents and plan the case. And, you know, if we decide to do a guided surgery, they'll move in the guided surgery direction. If we decide to use that and make a, you know, print out a model into a thermoform matrix to do kind of just a suck down type guide, we'll move in that direction. But that's, that's kind of the same procedure that all of our patients go through when we work these patients up. And so the classes and whatnot kind of mirror what we do with our okay. patients. So. so from the, wow, really, I mean, I think that this is state of the art. In education, yeah. it's teaching restorative um, design and restorative driven procedures, which is what we've all been wanting for years right. to be taught in school. And so I don't think like it's not anything new, but you are applying technology. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a couple things in there that I thought was just very interesting. Every patient that comes into the implant clinic gets a digital scan. Talk a little bit about that. What made you move in that direction? So part of that, you know, again, they can do either which way, take a conventional impression or the scan, but part of it is our students love to scan. I mean, they would rather scan than take an impression all day long. And, mm -hmm. you know, that comes from learning right out of the gate how to scan. And, you know, when you, for, so much of dentistry, as you guys know, it's just muscle memory. You know, you're building up kind of repetitious skills over and over and over. And that's what these students are learning. And I mean, 
when you get that fundamental in first year, by the time you get to third year, you're so used to scanning, you're much better at scanning than you are taking a conventional impression that they just hop right on the mm. scanners and, and get to going. And the scanners these days are so much easier than the scanner. You know, I mean, got our first scanner in 2006. You know, at that time, you could take one picture. You know, if you're really good, you took three pictures. You right. know, and now the kids can get in there with these scanners and, you know, take a full art scan and a minute and a half, two minutes, first time picking it up and using it on a patient. So it's, it's quite impressive with how user-friendly the, the technology has become. And because of that, it's, it's helped enhance our patient's experience and our student's experience overall. Well, I think it's interesting what you're saying, though, just to kind of like go back to that first question, you know, that what's the norm and kind of what you guys are doing. And, you know, I, I love to hear <clears throat> that this is how you're teaching it, you know, that it's, the idea is, because because like you say, Mark, when we were in school, we had the opportunity to participate in the surgery, and that was really progressive for the time. But we what we didn't have the ability to do really was to do probably as much of the restorative planning as we would like. Right. Now we we made you know basic suck down type of guides that we had to bring into the clinic, you know, to have available. But you know the the thing it sounds like that's made it possible for these workups to be done in a time efficient manner to where you can actually do more than like one case is digital. Yeah. I mean, if you can go in and you can pop a tooth into uh, a planning software in 30 seconds instead of 30 minutes, right. uh, and it actually looks good versus a wax up that's your third or fourth tooth you've ever really waxed up, uh, I mean, you have really economies of time. Right. Uh, and I would think that the students um, could just have a lot more experiences with implants just simply because of digital scans and digital wax ups. I mean, is that is that do you feel like that's one of the keys to why you're able to actually do more of this? Yeah, you know, I do. I mean, it, it's just the type of thing where it, it, it lets their creativity go and they get excited about it and they're pumped about it. The, they can show the patients, the patients get excited about it. And I mean, it's the type of thing where... Yeah, and I'm trying to remember the numbers, but I think our students are 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 finishing with anywhere between, you know, six and eight restora implant restorations each before they even leave our doors. So I mean, they're getting wow, a nice. lot of experience with these things, and you know, we're trying. What I've also tried to do with them is try to take them to that kind of next step further. So you know, similar things. If we're bone grafting, we try to do fixed provisionals. So we'll go ahead and design those, mill those out, or print those out for our patients. And they get the experience of learning how to finish those things and whatnot before, you know, so it's just not hit a button and get it out of the mill or hope your lab tech does it. They've got mm -hmm. to sit down with me and we finish it all up and put it in. And I think it's been a great experience to see how all the different ways which you can use the technology on these patients. Ah, now, who's who's placing the majority of these implants? Who, who actually does the surgery? So currently, right now, you know, it's our oral surgery and our perio residence. Um, hopefully here in the next probably three or four months our students will be placing and the way that we're mm. going to do that is again we're going to run it out of the implant clinic um we're going to have residents up in our clinic so we can just combine there and you know about every wednesday we're going to be doing student cases and it's got to be you know have at least two implants in it student will place one the resident will place the other or it's all place one and then the, the student will do the other whoever the preceptor is so but that should be coming down the pike here hopefully i mean to be truly honest i should have already had this done but yeah. there's just a lot of logistics that go into it, making sure all the other departments are happy and everybody's kind of getting along together. But, you know, we've got a great support system at, at MUSC throughout all the departments. And, I mean, everybody kind of works works as one, so it's a real, real good place for that to be able to be accomplished. So, hmm. John and I feel like that you're kind of leading the forefront here of creating a system of teaching that's allowing you to have a workflow that's repeatable. Right. Are you going to any um, educational meetings and presenting what you're doing and, and teaching other schools, hey, look at what we're doing here, or people calling and saying, hey, Mark, come up here and show us what you're doing? Yeah, we, yeah that, that's one of those things that happens very frequently. We have a lot of schools that want to come over, and they, they come over, spend some time with myself, my time with, again, my colleague Wally. And, you know, we just go through and show them, you know, here's where we start on A and run it all the way through from first year all the way to fourth year. And we do that quite frequently. I mean, one of the things I've been very privileged to work on over the past four or five years now is, is the ACP has had a huge push 
um, through an unrestricted grant from Henry Schein to actually get digital into all universities where, you know, we've worked together as a big curriculum group and built uh, almost plug and play booklet that any school can go ahead and take. It's got learning objectives. It's got everything anyone could need to be able to just pick up the curriculum and plug it into where, whichever realm they want to pick it into, whether it's fixed, removable, mm. implant, whatever. <clears throat> and it's just a, a, a very good resource that, you know, the ACP and Henry Schein have put together for schools to mm. be able to do it. Because, you know, not everybody needs to reinvent the wheel. I mean, we've already right. gone through a lot of these growing pains. And so there's no need for them to go through the growing pains as well. So because of that, that's why huh. we've produced this, you know, and it's gone through, you know, actually it just a couple months ago went throughout the whole world now is that it's available for educators throughout the entire, entire world. So that's been really cool. I, I so get- if, so if your students, you're saying, you know, are, are, are getting this kind of experience. And I think that that's awesome. I mean, a lot of them can go out and at least be comfortable with the nuts and bolts of basic single tooth implant dentistry right. as far as restorative and maybe even over time uh, have some familiarity with the surgery. Um, but I, I guess I have, I have maybe two questions I want you to, to answer with kind of the next step with that because these students get out and, you know, obviously MUSC, they've got ex- pretty, you know, some decent experience, but, but you know, what what's the next step? For, first off, um, should they be... Uh, doing a lot of implant dentistry when they get out of school. Do you feel like that's the place they should start focusing on their continued education? And, and if so, or even if not, what do you think the next place that you would tell your students to go if they want to learn more about implant dentistry in general, uh, especially the more complex things as far as like more surgical or more advanced restorative? What, what do you tell them? That, so that's the million dollar question right there. It's just because, again, I actually get that question multiple, multiple, multiple times, you know, over the past couple months, because right as they're entering their fourth year, they're like, hold on, how do I learn more? So Mm -hmm. basically, you know, what worked for me um, was, you know, I had the privilege to do it. It was about a 200 and something hour implant residency. You know, this was up in Heber, Utah, uh, when I was in practice in Salt Lake. And uh, that was wonderful because with it, it, it went from, you know, basics. It was a very clinically based residency and it went from the basics all the way up to the very advanced stuff. And I think one of the key components to any type of, of coursework you do is there needs to be a hands-on component because, I mean, we can all read books. We can go to lectures and just look at pretty pictures and, and learn didactic material. But the reality is, as dentists, we have to use our hands. And the first time you use your hands doing something, it's always a little bit challenging. And that's why I think from a, re- you know, from a course type centers, you need to find something from a CE perspective where you actually do use your hands and it complements the skills and things that, that you're trying to find and get out of it. So I think a big place to start is make sure you, you really dial in from the restorative side how to, how to get things set that way. And then once you feel very comfortable with that, move into the surgical placement if that's what you're into. Um, I like that, Mark, too. I like the fact that you said it that way. You know, start with becoming comfortable with the restorative. Uh, And I think what I'm sure goes along with that is just treatment planning in general. Yeah, that's, you know, being that's it. That's that's it, (laughs) right? right? That's everything. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, the treatment planning is the most important part. I mean, and that's what we see, you know, as a prosthodontist, I have to deal with a lot of cases that haven't quite gone ideally. Um, and a lot of it just seems to be treatment planning, you know, whether the teeth yeah. weren't in the right spot when they first did it, whether there were no teeth and they just said, Hey, here's some bone, let's put in some implants. And it, it all comes down to treatment planning. And I think if you really understand restorative, that's where it all begins because, you know, then we kind of work our way back because people ultimately are coming in for the teeth. They're not coming in for a screw. The screw is just to help facilitate the tooth. So, mm-hmm. so yeah. I really like the fact that your goal is one, teaching diagnostics. You know, it's the key. And then when you come out of school, it's learning more about, you know, how we do more diagnostics and treatment plan. I mean, that that to me, I think, is the biggest thing that John and I see questions about um, across our journey is that people get into situations where they learn the surgery part first 
because that's the super cool part. I want to incorporate right. the surgery into my practice. And really, they are great bread and butter, even maybe crown and bridge and full arch dentist. Maybe even they are that. Uh, most of the time, they may have a lot of expense, uh, experience in crown and bridge. But I think the, the misstep here is not incorporating restorative implant knowledge first. Well, yeah, it all comes back to what we say, and I think the prosthodontists across the world all say the same thing, that it's everything is dentures, you know? And if yeah. you if you know where eight and nine need to go <laughs> in someone's face, then you're done. You pr- you're yeah. done, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you think about how much, how little denture, for instance, training that we get, you know? And I know that dentures are not sexy. Uh, and a lot of this stuff, frankly, is not quote unquote sexy in terms of, you know, what the perception is. Implant surgery is, is quote unquote sexy, but if you don't understand dentures and where everything needs to go and, and how to, and where, where are, where is your patient versus that ideal denture, right? Then you really maybe don't have a lot of business putting implants in. Yeah. I mean, I I couldn't agree more. You know, I think like Iva Clar should have a thing that says, you know, bring sexy back with their, you know, with their (laughs) new (laughs) Fenaris. Yeah. Yeah. The new Fenaris three or something, bring sexy. Yeah. But I would, I would, yeah, buy I would buy I that would buy too, that. to be truly honest. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, guys. Make us some of that. But yeah, that's a free yeah, one there, for there right there. But, let's, but let's you know, to, cha- to be honest, you know, they, they, you know, I've been working with them with their digital denture for a couple of years. And to be honest, it gets kids excited. I mean, I, I've mm-hmm. never seen it before. We're, we're implementing it. You know, we're, we're right in the process of finalizing the software acquisition. And like, you know, we just did one um, last week. And I mean, they're pumped. They're like, oh my gosh, you can move the teeth here. You know, because it's the same principles we're teaching implants. They're like, you know, it's yeah. just a full mouth yeah. wax up now. You know, mm-hmm. and I, I think it is getting things more exciting. But I mean, you guys are completely right. It's the fundamental principles of dentures. Show, get me an incisal edge of number eight, case is done. That's all I need yeah. is that one landmark. Mm-hmm. And we can make it all work due to the principles that we all know and use every day relative to complete dentures. But I think that's, yeah. again, and that's why I was saying earlier, you know, hybrids are kind of that pinnacle just because that's what you use on these cases. Whether they have teeth or whether they don't have teeth, it's the same principles over and over and over and yeah. over again. So, to kind of yeah. finish out our conversation, I'd like to talk about some really cool Super sexy yeah, stuff. We're going right, right. to talk about the stuff that everyone agrees is sexy. So com- everyone, compound and border molding, right? No. <laughs> exactly. Yes, you water got baths. It. Yeah. yeah. Water Let's bath. talk green stick. Water right baths. Now. Let's yep. talk about water baths. What's the best water bath on the market? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone. <laughs> right. You hot water out of your spigot. Right. Yeah. That's so, right. well, uh, look, you know, uh, recently, I think, you know, John and I have been covering uh, the scanner market here in the last six months. From a standpoint of like what scanners can do, um, what's available to us today, predictably, and what's maybe super fringe. We call it what the cool kids are doing. Right. And maybe some of the envelope pushers. Um, Recently, we feel like that uh, on the scanner market with the introduction of Prime Scan, the future introduction of um, uh, Trios Trios 4, 4. uh, yeah, which is a big software up you know, upgrade to the Trios ecosystem, 3Shape there being kind of the leader of that. Um, but these two particular companies, uh, there's some other companies in, uh, that are scanning, obviously, have really pushed the limits. And we're hearing, we're hearing and we're seeing um, some things being done that concerning the most precise restorations uh, that we do in dentistry today, which happens to be full arch, fixed um, implant prosthetics, right. uh, whether that be bar over dentures or whether that be fixed hybrids, which we know have to have a certain accuracy not to put stress or strain on uh, the screw in a cross arch situation. Yeah. I want you to speak to what's possible, what you're seeing that has really changed to make it possible today to be able to do some of these restorations and what some of the pitfalls are that really people could fall into from maybe what we see and yeah. what is actually yeah. achievable. Like what's what's possible and then what's not really possible, but because, people are still saying is possible. Because oh, boy, you're a, trying to get me ahead. in trouble here with this one. Thanks, guys. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> okay, so first off, let me just start off with scanning because, again, that's kind of the fundamentals of all of it. Without the scanner, I mean, all the workflows kind of fall through. Uh, you know, we've been testing scanners since, you know, about 2012 with Emily Batson's study. And, I mean, we just completed one. Uh, we just published one that was actually on a cadaver, which is the first one kind of done ever where we've actually got soft tissue, we've got cross arch, we've got everything like that. And the interesting thing is if you look at the scan, the way that these scanners work relative to PVS, for example, I mean, the accuracy is there. I mean, we had a couple scanners, you know, when you look at significance relative to these studies, you know, there were three scanners that actually beat PVS um, on a cadaver, you know, on a true tissue and an enamel, a dentin, et cetera. And if you look at the prime scan, you know, we've been examining it right now through a materials type study. And we're getting, with the latest software updates, we're getting cross arch trueness of between eight and nine microns, which is in really freaking insane. That is, that is insane. Right. That's better than anything out there. That's better than the gold standards Empergum, right? Right. And for cross arch. It, it, it's, so it's been... I, I mean, again, I, you know, in full disclosure, I do a lot with Dent Supply Serona, <clears throat> but I use all the scanners. I've used, you know, a Trios almost exclusively for, you know, the past about three or four years. I, I also use, an, you know, use the Omnicam and the Emerald, but my go-to is a Trios. And again, with, with the Prime Scan, I've never seen anything that can scan this accurate yet. Um, hmm. So again, I think with all these scanners, and if you look at, you know, this paper we just finished writing up, I mean, the accuracy of these scanners is getting very, very, very good to the point, you know, where a lot of them are getting sub 25 microns. And I mean, that's one heck of a, of a good modality to capture these things. The biggest right. problem that you have with these is any of the workflows that really go full arch, they're all kind of third-party developed workflows. So none of the mm. implant companies themselves have come out and said, hey, here's a workflow. Here's how you do full arch, okay? This is the authorized workflow. We've got these scan bodies to do this and this and this. And no one besides the third-party vendors have an actual multi-unit scan body yet. So I think that's a lot where the problems are being with these full arch cases is that one, there's not a workflow. And the secondary thing, if you're going to do something like zirconia, most of the time you're, you're either milling directly to fixture, which works quite well with these things, but you've got to have a tool path on your mill in a very certain way to get these things to mill correctly. If not, what you're having to do is glue in inserts. And that's always been the weak point with, with monolithic zirconia full arch restorations is there's a cement layer that's <clears throat> got a little bit of slop and that's that's where the weak point with this whole thing is. So, you know, people are still either printing out a model and putting the analogs in, which may, you know, have a little bit of slot built in there due to inaccuracies of printers, or else they're just, you know, milling it to a certain parameter and gluing them in and hoping that it moves to the mouth, or else they're taking a model anyway to be able to pick everything up, or they're picking it up in the mouth. So there's multiple ways to do it, but that's where the limitation is, is when you have to go to an insert, and be able to pick things up on, on something. And I think that's where the biggest problem with, with doing these things completely digital is, is that way. Can you do it? You bet. Do they work? You know, there's a lot of great clinicians out there that do it. We've, you know, tried multiples, you know, and they work well. But I think, you know, and I know from dent supply side, we're working on the protocols right now. So hopefully, you know, I know we were just joking about AO, but AO 2020, I think we should have things pretty much put together by then for these mm. things so validate so saying <laughs> oh go ahead go ahead bust go ahead we both got yeah. questions so what you're what you're saying what you're saying mark is you're saying <laughs> that there's going to be validated manufacturers protocols that will say we can do full arch and the trueness is there now, without a verification that's jig, what, that, that's it, right? Without that's the question. Or the rubber meets the road. Mark is: Do you need a verification jig? jig? That because is here's here's what we've been told. Yeah. Okay, all of our prosthetic training says that the minute, and you said it in here, in other words, the minute that we move from digital to analog, there's problems. There's there. and and it's and it's the, either the printer is not the resolution's not good enough. Or the CAD CAM mill machine is not 
good enough. Right. The trueness and precision of that machine. Yeah. And so there's some a lot of calibration in those two machines. But what you're saying is that the variable of the scanner itself is eliminated at this point with some of the, this newer scanning technology. Agreed. But how are you doing this without analog? We will tell you. In a few months. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, you. Man, we got to no, have him back I on the show. You. Again. Wait. Hold it right there. That's the end of the show. Yeah, we're done. Right. <laughs> yeah. Should I just drop yeah. this mic? Right. No. Yeah, drop the so mic. So, that, that, again, that's what we're working on right now because that's where the problem is. You know, and we've, we've all been taking it from one way as we've always done, just, you know, straight to fixture. We've always thought of it kind of that way, and that's the way we need to do that. And so we've kind of carried that over to the full arch way. The funny thing is, you know, how you get these these days is you take a model, you stick it in a scanner and you scan them, you scan the model and you move that way. So, I mean, some of these workflows are, are, are taken from that and moving over. Again, do we have mm -hmm. all the workflows figured out and everything set yet? No, that's why things aren't being released yet. But that is the way which we're moving. That's the way we're going. And again, I'm hoping by, you know, midway through next year, you know, we've got some of these things available and us to go. So... I think we're well, that's yeah, awesome. I think we're getting there, but again, there's you know, it's just like anything. I mean, the first time you know, just look at how far scanning's gone in, you know, the past 15 years. It's incredible. And, you know, it, it was funny we helped kind of develop and test this thing called immediate smiles, which, you know, you guys may know or not know it, but it's basically where you've got, you know, a surgical guide with your custom abutment in your your crown where you can put it all together and it comes together in the mouth and I, I yep. still remember when we did that the first time we just were like holy crap it worked you know this thing really <laughs> works and right. so we've been trying to take that concept and evolve it to the full arch realm and that's where some of all these ideas are coming together so you know when we first started looking at it you know the slot factor when we ran our first kind of test back in 2015 16 was about 300 microns you need about mm. 300 microns of slop you know and again cement spacer and different stuff like that i mean you, with resin cement you're kind of in there anyway <clears throat> but the tolerances have been getting better and better and better and better and again hopefully within the next year we've got workflows if we still don't to be truly honest i'm fine with that because it's you know i'll take my one single impression and take all my other scans and merge that one single impression to that Right. And that way works just fine. You know, I, I'm not one of those that's like, I, I have to do everything digital or else I'm going to explode. You know, I mean, let's do right. what's best. And for that's what we think is a reasonable is the reasonable approach. That's really the thing that kind of gets us. It gets kind of gets under our skin a little bit is the idea of saying, well, we, you know, I'm going to do that even though it's not really working just to say I did right. it. You know, like you say, taking a single impression and, and using either the either the provisional as the verification right. jig or making a verification jig. It's very simple steps. And and then we can still use our PMMA and scan it on a model and merge it and not even have to send it back to the lab. I mean, there's a lot of things we can do now, but what you're saying really intrigues me about the scanner now. I just want to like maybe circle back to that one more sure. time about eight to nine microns of <laughs> trueness. Isn't that because freaking crazy? What else? <laughs> It's blowing my like, mind that you say that. Do you think that it is the hardware or do you think it's the software? software. Well, no, I take that back. At, at this point, it's both, to be truly honest. It's the hardware and the software. The biggest thing which we've seen and one of the most interesting things we saw, we, we ran a study that we published in 16 from data on 2015. Then because of some issues we saw in, in the data, we ran it again. And the very interesting thing is just from software updates, you know, it took something from a quadrant perspective that was, you know, trueness to about 50 to 90 microns and dropped it to between four and 25 microns just mm, from software. Just a software Just upgrade. straight up software upgrades, you know, no, wow. no hardware upgrades. And, and that's the beauty about these things. And that's what freaks people out sometimes about buying the scanners is, you know, it's just like you buy a new laptop, then you go into Best Buy and all of a sudden they've got the new one there and you just bought one a week ago. You know, so everyone is nervous about that with the scanners. But the thing you have to realize is that these things get better through software. You know, the hardware, mm -hmm. it's got to be up to a certain snuff. But the software is where all the real innovation and things come from, whether it's speed or accuracy, because it all has to do with algorithms and, and math and the way it puts the models together. And that's what actually makes the biggest difference with these things. So, hmm. And I guess that's why Trios 4 basically looks exactly the same yep. and yet is able to scan, a, at least according to what we're seeing, significantly faster and with more accuracy 
and it looks like it has the same form factor. Now, Corsaric went a little different direction because they made a ginormous yeah, scanner, yeah. Uh, which which that's still something Wes and I talked about before on the show that it, it's, it's pretty darn huge. It is. But you're telling but us- But it's got a huge feel as well. Well, yeah, exactly. And But the thing we kind of were complaining about, to be honest with you, with our in our Prime Scan episode that we did was there's no peer-reviewed data. There is no peer-reviewed data on Prime Scan, and here it is released. And but I'm very encouraged, though, yeah. to hear what you're saying. Kudos this is, to this is Serana you and what show, they're though. doing. Is you're doing it? You're doing the research because we bring the people. <laughs> Mark, you yeah. are the guy. That's you're doing, the guy. You're the guy doing the, the research, guy. Mark. Now, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've again, we just submitted last week. Uh, Wally Renee submitted, you know, this this paper that I mean, we we tested. Trios 3, Prime Scan, Medit, Meta HD, the Emerald, Emerald S, Omnicam, mm. Mm. Um, Itero Element, and Itero Element 2. Wait a minute. This all is my the, kind of study right here. This is like here, all the, all the scanners that we just went over. Can you ours. tell us the results? <laughs> um, or no? It's okay again, if you can't. The Prime Scan's great. You know, the, the Trios 3, it's a good <laughs> scanner. Elements two is a good scanner, you know. They've they've all kind of got their goods and their bads. And what we did? What about the Medit? What about the Medit? The Medit was actually really good. You know, the Medit okay. the Medit HD okay. was it was a good scanner. I mean, I, I was okay. I was very impressed with it. <clears throat> I mean, and that that's mm. one of the beauties about where we're at is we've got opportunity to use all of these different scanners. So I, I mean, I use these things all day every day. So we kind of know mm -hmm. how to use them. And, so, and we get the ability to test them. And we've got a big study that will be starting here uh, first week, well, end of June, start of July, where we're going to test all of them, including the Trios 4. We're getting one of those set over so we can really, you know, it's another one of our cadaver studies. So it, it should be are, pretty, pretty interesting. Are you excited about Trios 4? I, you know, I played with it. It scanned a lot like our Trios 3. Um, hmm. If it increases the scanning, yes, and it, it, it increases how true it is. I'm absolutely excited for it. As far as the tips go, you know, I, I'm not all that pumped because those aren't things that I'm going to be using. I'm just looking at how good of a model, you know, a, a digital model I can get of it. And again, if <clears throat> I haven't really seen any data as far as how much better it is relative to that, and that's why I'm really excited. You know, they're they're bringing one. A, one out for us at the end of end of June to start putting it through the paces of testing. And I'm super excited for that because I want to see how it stacks up to the prime scale. Isn't it interesting though? Like that. Th and again, I know that I, like I, we don't, we're not trying to like bash companies or whatever because we we're really glad that they're innovating, right. but it's so interesting, much like what we've seen in like say bonding agents, <laughs> they just put them on the market and I mean, they all, and they're like, well, it's better. And so it's $20,000 more, Right. but there's no data. And then you guys are out there doing the data. And then it takes what, a year to get a publication to, to print, maybe more. And then, I mean, at that point, like the, they're already selling them and people don't even know if they're good. Right. I mean, that's the hard part with doing real thorough peer reviewed data is because, you know, we've tried to come up with some very, very good, compelling studies that are clinically relevant to us. And, you know, what we try to do is we try to finish it, put it directly into the statistics so we can get the statistics, you know, as fast as we can. And then we literally just start writing the papers immediately because, you know, the process takes some time for it to get out there. You know, yeah. again, the one we just submitted last week, you know, it'll probably, <clears throat> we'll be lucky if it's towards, you know, the end of the year, start of next year. And, and it, again, by that time, still, you know, the machines will have been out for six, eight months, something like that. But still, it would be greater if we could get them out earlier. But, you right. know, that's just the reality of when you have to do these things and you have the peer review process, which is great. You know, it just does take time to to go through things. Right. But, but Especially when they're upgrading these machines uh, every, say, couple years. Yeah. It becomes like a like testing phones. You know, it's just right. like by the time you 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 get the, the 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 testing out there, there's already they're already the new one is already on the horizon. So I mean, I get it. That's why, like I say, I'm not I'm not trying to be too hard on companies because on their to to be fair to them, the amount of time that it would take to do the testing that would delay the release and the sales. I mean, they want to get it on the market. They they have obviously enough internal data that they feel like they can you know lean on right. that and that the data will be proven. 
you know, but it is interesting because, you know, here we're talking about, you know, $40,000 investment for a clinician and you're going, well, is this $40,000 investment better than what I currently have? Like we were talking a lot about that with Omnicam. We're like, if you're an Omnicam user and you just bought it last year, is it worth, you know, going to PrimeScan? Prime and, and up until you have literally talked to us tonight, we had no data to actually base that decision on. Yeah. It was just kind of like a feeling. Like, I feel yeah, like it's it a little should better. should be better. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and again, the, the thing which you have to look at as well with it, it, when you read the papers or any of this stuff, is what is the software version? Because like I say, when we did the one we just published, you know, it averaged out to, I think it was 17 microns cross arch. And then just from a later update, that's when it's even dropped more. And that's wow. that's the interesting thing is just from these darn software updates, they get that much better. And so it's it's just a tough thing for a consumer because, you know, you guys are right. I mean, I remember, you know, when I threw down a hundred and some thousand for mine back in the day, it was like, holy crap, you know. Yeah. Back then, that you know, there was one. So, I mean, it was no big deal. It's like right. I'm buying that. But... It's the type of thing where, you know, there's a lot of choices. So you have to make, I mean, not, not one CE event goes by that after I get down off the podium, someone comes by and says, it's like, hey, man, all right, what should I buy? You know, right. because of course, they, of you know, course. they really want to know which option is the best and, and how to move things forward because it is, a, let's talk. It is a, as we kind of close out here, I think that I would love to hear you talk just briefly on how to be cautious in this area. Um, because I feel like there's a lot of looseness out there when yeah. it comes to digital. And if you understand the term looseness, right? Right. It's, there's, it, we have to be very careful. There's so many variables that affect the outcome. Right. And I'm a, I'm a little concerned. I'm, I'm positive with what I've just heard. <clears throat> right. But, but I'm also, I'd like for you to speak just as we kind of close out the show to our listeners I want you to hear what Mark has to say about some caution areas, things to just be aware of and be very careful with. Mark? So I guess the first thing, I, two points that I'll start off with. The first is, I mean, you could literally walk out the door, you know, at your local trade show and blow 300K without even breaking a sweat. You know, I'm buying all the newest, latest, and greatest toys and everything involved with that. I think the first thing, especially from a private practice perspective, is, is really sit down with you and your staff and figure out what your vision is and how best you can enhance your patient care. And that's where you start off with what things can you do to augment what you're currently doing, you know, whether that's a scanner, whether that's a mill, whether that's, you know, implant planning software, whatever it may be. That's what you need to focus on and start with that, that you're going to see some sort of ROI, whether it's, you know, patient really driven ROI or whether it's just patient experience type of ROI. But you really start with that because I think that's the fundamental thing because we've got so many things that we could go buy is figuring out what's best for you and your practice. The second thing which I would say is you have to realize, as we talked about with, with dentures, you know, again, give me one in size ledge and we're done. These things are tools. It doesn't supplant quality dentistry. It is just an adjunct. It's another way of doing your dentistry. It doesn't change, you know, completely revolutionize everything you do and is going to change the way you do. The principles are the same, whether you're doing an analog or a digital modality. And that's what you have to realize is they're just tools. So you need to know how to use those tools and figure out how best to apply the tools because the reality is... You know, as we're talking about, you know, pushing the envelopes with some of these things, the reality is you, you use the best tool for the situation you're in. And that's, mm. it doesn't need to completely dominate your life. You're the clinician. So figure out how best to use this tool versus any other tool that you've got in your toolbox, because that's what these things are. So th those would, I mean, those are kind of philosophical things, but those would be my, my biggest things to look at is just, See how these things can augment your practice and your patient's life. I mean, the biggest thing which I see is, you know, people get so darned excited when you start using these things that it really breathes some life into your practice and some life into, you, into the things which you've been doing kind of rotely and routinely for, for a long time. And again, it doesn't come without pain. You know, the first time you scan <laughs> someone, you know, you're getting the ear and everything like that. I mean, it's a, it's a tough go. But, yep. 
you know, everything has its learning, learning challenges and you're going to get through it. And you just need to figure out how best those are going to function into your current practice model. So, Hmm. Mm. well, I'll just say like, this has been awesome because not only is it great to have you on the show, like that's just really cool to get to get to connect with you in this way and to see what you're doing. Um, but to get what I feel like, Wes, is probably the most progressive look we've had at, at, at number one, dental education as far as implants go. Mm. Number two, really doing the research that is helping to define, to kind of like hold the manufacturer's feet to the fire a little bit about what really is possible. And I'm excited too, just mm. finally to just think about a manufacturer workflow yep. for Full Arch Digital that would be validated and we could stop having to- <laughs> Jimmy rig uh, everything. <laughs> right, we could stop having, yeah, to go from uh, you know a scanning interface to uh, you know AutoCAD <laughs> or you know going through all these various programs that we we all know and I'm yeah. not going to go into what, it mesh in order to st- right uh, oh uh, you you just went there you yeah. said the words the M word yeah, yeah. <laughs> the M word has been spoken yeah. I mean you have to you know where you have to 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 navigate back and forth and and you basically the amount of time that it takes to learn all these different software programs and you basically have to have essentially a an in-house digital lab tech. technician if you really want to be efficient and you know if we could get away with it from that if we could have if you will a serec for full arch implants you know mm-hmm. that could could be a machine that we could plug in our scan and it would be able to uh, uh, allow with combination with a, with a real lab you know, a, a real lab that can actually, that actually has the time and the expertise to help you plan these cases and be able to, to really take all of the back and forth out of the equation and all the third parties out of the equation. Um, this is where I feel like a company like Serona, as much of a hard time as Serona gets for being uh, sometimes more closed off, I feel like they're the perfect company to be able to pull something like that off. And I think it's really cool that you're kind of getting to see that happen yeah. in your world. I mean, that, that's gotta be exciting to maybe be a part of that and maybe to think like, okay, AO 2020, mm. maybe you or we'll Lyndon or one of these folks is gonna be talking about, okay, we're unveiling you know, the real deal. That's pretty much Yeah, I mean, that's, like I say, that's the goal. Cause uh, you know, Craig Mish said, hey, AO 2020, you've got to be on the main podium speaking on full arch implant restorations and scanning. Ah. And I'm like, for, okay. wait, for you? Yeah, so I've got to do that this coming March. Oh, Congratulations, man. man so, that's amazing. So yeah, it should. I, that's why, you know, we've been working on these things for years. And so I went back to, you know, Dent Supply Serona and I went, you know, I said, look, we've been working on it. It needs to be done now or else I've got to show the ways, you know, as you guys are talking about, you know, these, these all these alternate pathways. I mean, the way I do it now is I trick three shape with some lab soft, with some lab scanning, you know, scan bodies. And it, it's a complete backdoor bootleg to be able to do it, but yep. we should have some, hopefully again, you know, with, with FDA and different things like that, you know, sometimes things get, get slow, but like I say, hopefully I've got something to talk about or it's going to be a really short lecture. So really, really short. <laughs> well, with, yeah. that, with that said, we hope it's a really long yeah. lecture. Yeah. And what we would love to do is sometime, whether it's, you know, in the short run or the long run, when that happens, when, you know, we'd love to have you back on the show sure. and really dissect that. Mm. Um, in no. fact, I just got an interesting, Wes, I got to tell you more about this, but I just got an interesting contact from the AO about some things that we might be able to be involved yeah. with with AO 2020. So we'll kind of see. But but I think that the the time is coming where, Mark, we, one of the things I just want to, for our listeners, you know, mark my words here, Mark Ludlow, you're probably going to hear a little bit about this guy. And and I can tell you, I, I, I feel like uh, it's it's kind of an honor it is to have you on the show at this point in your career because I feel like where we're going with we're some excited. of the stuff you're you're doing it's gonna be it's gonna be up and up so thank you once again for being on the show with us thank today. you Mark so much really appreciate it yeah giving us your time yeah, thanks for having me guys I mean <laughs> you know we could sit here and chat about things for the next five hours you know and oh, man. that's that's just the fun thing about this stuff it's, it's just so fun to talk about dentistry and have fun and all the different things we're doing so thank you very much for yeah. putting these on thank you for having me on I I really appreciate it. 
And John, it's good yeah. to see you again, man. I mean, this is yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> just so cool. A little so reunion cool. here. Yeah, we, you know, we, right. yeah, we, little cadaver, we need to get a cadaver lab. Yeah, exactly. Here. I mean, I, yeah. let's start cutting Maybe. something up over here. It'll be great. You know, <laughs> not just a rug. Right. So it'll be it'll be good times. <laughs> hey, so I'll close with this, guys. If you're listening to this show right now and um, you're you're loving this content, the way that people find out about us is for you to share what you just heard and something you just heard tonight that you just probably or today that really kind of piqued your interest, send it to a friend, tell them, hey, look, we just heard that they're working on validated workflows, manufacturers, send this, send this podcast to somebody. Let Dent Supply Serona know that you're excited about what you heard and the research that's being done in Mark's hands. We're excited about that. So, Hey, look, the way that you, the way that we tell people about the dental guys is through you. And so if you'll head over to Facebook, send us a shout out there, give us a like, Hey, listen, give us five stars on iTunes. That's the way we roll. I want people to know about us there. That's how we grow this podcast. And so again, it's been a pleasure to have Mark on. And uh, so for Mark and John, I'm Wes and we are the dental guys.